So good evening and welcome. I'm Helene Marsh. I'm the Vice President of Environmental Forum of Marin and co-chair of our community education events. So the last few weeks have really been extremely challenging for Californians. 80 people, more than 80 people have died in the um, camp in Woolsey fires. More than 1,200 are still missing. Tens of thousands of people have lost their homes. And impacts also include terrible air quality for millions in the state, environmental contamination, wildlife deaths and um, displacement, and vast amounts of CO2 emissions. So climate change impacts in California include higher temperatures, less precipitation, and more powerful winds, resulting in a longer fire season and record-breaking record fires. 65 fires are burning in California right now, and the San Francisco Chronicle now has a full-time fire reporter. So does this look familiar to you? How many people have experienced some form of impact, adverse impact from these fires recently? So I think that's really almost the whole room. And we absolutely have to all work together across the country and across the world to implement large scale climate solutions that are gonna save us and the planet. As we know within our own country, there are deep divisions in our political system, vastly different perspectives on environmental issues and disagreements among those who want change as to what that change should look like. So our goal for this evening is to understand what it might take to cross these divides for effective problem solving. We're extremely fortunate to have guest speakers this evening with deep understanding of these issues, and I'd like to thank them for their time, passion, and expertise. Environmental Forum of Marin has been working for 46 years, training advocates for the environment, and delivering community education events such as this one. We hope you enjoy tonight's program and leave inspired to do something yourselves to bridge the divide and work together. So I'm now honored to introduce our Congressman Jared Huffman, U.S. Representative for California's 2nd District. Where are you? Good looking crowd there. So Congressman Huffman has represented California's second district, which spans coastal counties from the Golden Gate Bridge up to the Oregon border since January of 2013. He's a member of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and the Committee on Natural Resources. Beginning in the new congressional term, Huffman will chair the, National, uh, the Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water, Power, and Oceans. So congratulations. So both in the State Assembly and Congress, Jared Huffman has worked across the aisle to forge bipartisan consensus. Two years ago, Huffman launched a podcast called Off the Cuff with Jared Huffman to share his work with constituents. Off the Cuff is a place for productive discussions and open dialogue about how we can make our community and our nation a better place to call home. It's through discussion, fair debate, and exploration of common interest that we can find common ground and bridge the divide. Please welcome Congressman Jared Huffman. Well, thank you, Helen. And uh, what a great turnout. I am so thrilled to be with all of you. And uh, let me just take a moment to say uh, what a huge fan of the environmental forum of Marin uh, I have always been. It really is one of the great environmental organizations uh, in this community, and it wouldn't exist if it weren't for some real environmental legends who I've looked up to for many, many years. A bunch of them are in this room, uh, and too many to call out, but there's one that I just have to call out because he's been one of my heroes for a couple decades now, from the very first time I even thought about running for office for the Marin Water Board back in 1994. Uh, Dr. Marty Griffin was my... <laughs> Mentor. Marin and Sonoma would be very different places if it were not for the environmental leadership of, of Marty Griffin and, and many others in this room. So thanks for what you do and, and thanks for the way that Environmental Forum has continued 
to make better environmentalists in our community and make better citizens. Uh, it's just been wonderful uh, to sort of check in every few years I get to participate on, you know, in, in one way or another as a speaker, as part of the program. And I just see generation after generation of uh, Marin County resident coming through this program and going on uh, to be great environmentalists and great citizens. So uh, that's wonderful stuff. Tonight we're, uh, we're talking about bridging the divide, the, the political divide for a healthy environment. And you have some wonderful speakers that are gonna follow me, uh, including Professor uh, Arlie Hochschild, who uh, you're gonna sell a few books tonight, I hope. I just had my podcast promoted, so I hope your book does as well as my podcast. Um, and uh, she'll talk about the sociology of that great divide. I'm gonna speak from the political perspective. And uh, let me just say it's almost impossible not to be a little partisan, unfortunately, when we talk about the environment right now. Uh, and that's a, a fairly recent phenomenon because uh, if you go back to the early days of the Environmental Forum, there were Republicans that helped to uh, create and lead the Environmental Forum not too long ago. And of course, you know, Peter Baer and many others, there were Republican environmental leaders here in Marin and in many other places around the country. That has really changed in recent years. The whole issue of protecting our environment has become radicalized along party lines. And we do need to improve that partisan divide over this issue because that situation is just not durable. It's not sustainable if we want to make progress and, and get things done. But I will say this about uh, this conversation, how to bridge the divide. I would much rather have this conversation with Republicans being in the majority than uh, from the perspective of the minority. And in that regard, I guess I, I start off with a little bit of good news because uh, the election that we had uh, a couple weeks ago, not only was a blue wave that uh, is still cresting actually, uh, some new numbers just came in and it, it looks like in addition to all the seats that we've flipped in California, we may yet flip another in the Central Valley uh, T.J. Cox is less than a thousand votes behind David Valadeo right now. And uh, Nate Silver, of all people, is projecting that Cox could pull it out. So uh, that's exciting. Uh, but this wave, this, this blue wave, is not only a big blue wave, it's a green wave. All over the country, we have had amazing candidates step forward, many of them with backgrounds in clean energy. These are folks who not only um, had the right position on climate change and environmental protection, uh, including a guy in Charleston, South Carolina, who won an incredible upset victory on the issue of offshore drilling, opposing offshore drilling in a re deep Republican district. So we not only had them taking the right positions, but in many cases, these candidates were leading with these issues, talking about the urgency of transitioning to a clean energy economy. So um, the next Congress uh, is going to be a heck of a lot greener and not just bluer, and that's kind of exciting for me, and I think it bodes very well. So I think this conversation, from my perspective, breaks down into two parts. One is sort of what it's been like the past six years as your representative in Congress. I have tried to bridge the divide wherever I can. I can talk a little bit about what I was able to do and, and some of the frustrations that I had. Uh, and then there's the part about where do we go from here with this new uh, political landscape, new and much improved from my perspective. So um, looking, looking back at the last six years, the first thing you need to know is that in every committee, at every level of the Republican Congress, and pretty much in every level of at least the Trump administration, that's just been the last two years, the agenda has been driven by the fossil fuel and mining industry all the way. Uh, at every turn, they have uh, pushed forward a race to extraction, a race to profit at the expense of environmental laws for the benefit of industry. Um, there's also the climate denial problem. Now, you've heard the, the good news from all of the polling. You know, Americans, like people around the rest of the world, are sort of figuring out that climate change is real. The percentage of people who are actual climate deniers keeps going down. It's, it's a very, very small percentage now. The problem is they're all serving in the United States Congress, <laughs> right? So that's a problem. My only option uh, in that climate was to 
try to build some, some relationships of trust and confidence. I have a lot of friends in the Republican caucus. Uh, you know, we differ politically, but I bring my Republican guests onto my podcast, as, as Helen knows. Uh, I try to find issues that we can work together on. Environmental ones are tough, but Mark Sanford in South Carolina is a good example. One of the most conservative members of Congress, um, but he actually accepts human-caused climate change. He lives in a coastal district that's terribly impacted by it. So we were never able to figure out anything to do together on climate change, but at least I could bring him on my podcast and we could have a conversation where I got a very conservative Republican to acknowledge the problem. That, I guess, was helpful. He, he got voted out of office by, <laughs> by his Republican constituents because he criticized Donald Trump. So, you know, he, he has paid a, a political price on his side of that. Uh, another colleague, Carlos Curbelo in Florida, accepted human-caused climate change, actually uh, was willing to do a few things, unlike most of, of his Republican colleagues. And, and very recently, just a couple months ago, he joined me on a letter to the EPA taken a very strong stand against this attempt by the Trump administration to withdraw California's waiver under the Clean Air Act that lets us pursue our own clean car standards. Us and, I believe, 13 other clean car states. So Carlos Cabello went on record with me, pushing back in favor of clean cars and, and higher emission standards. Um, he got voted out a couple Tuesdays ago, uh, unfortunately. Well. I don't know. He'll be replaced by a great uh, environmentalist, a Democrat, but that's sort of part of the, the political challenge of bridging the divide, having these conversations. The ones that are the most reachable are the Carlos Curbelos, who is moderate in a very close swing district. Those are also the low-hanging fruit for us as Democrats to take out. Uh, and Carlos Curbelo is out of a job. So uh, I was able to partner with another Republican from the Philadelphia area, Brian Fitzpatrick. He joined me on a bill to try to protect the, uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I was pleased that he and, and I think a half dozen other Republicans were still willing to stand up for wilderness. Uh, unfortunately, their Republican colleagues slipped a little provision into the Republican tax bill uh, a year and a half ago and uh, in, a tax, in a tax cut bill, they actually opened up the Arctic Refuge to drilling, and so they set us back in that regard. We're gonna challenge that in court, and uh, hopefully we're a long way from actual leases going out in the Arctic Refuge, and it'll give us enough time to get a new administration in place and a new Congress that will undo that, but right now, after all these years, going all the way back to the 80s where the Arctic Refuge has been protected, um, we are playing defense on trying to protect one of the most unique and special places in the world. Nevertheless, there was at least a Republican um, cohort with uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick that was willing to work with me on that. Uh, and then the most unlikely uh, collaboration, of course, uh, is a recent one uh, involving a, a very targeted attempt to try to help maintain uh, sustainable multi-generational ranching in the Point Reyes National Seashore. I teamed up with uh, very conservative, arch-conservative, you might say, Republican Rob Bishop of Utah, who I spend most of my time fighting with. Uh, and yet uh, we were able to come to an agreement on a bill that came out of the House with strong bipartisan support. is pending in the Senate. It may pass uh, in the, the weeks ahead in the lame duck session. Uh, we'll see where that goes. But that's about it. That's about the extent of what I was able to accomplish across the aisle in the previous six years. Now going forward, I see a really different um, set of possibilities. And I, I want you to know the change that you're gonna see with a Democratic House uh, will start with something that's been totally missing uh, the last couple of years, which is oversight. There has been no legislative oversight of the executive branch at all, and that's a critical function to have a government that actually works, to have checks and balances. Uh, so we're gonna get back in the oversight game, and that could create a little tension perhaps because some of my uh, some of my Republican colleagues are going to want to rally to the defense of the Trump administration you know that it's just sort of this um, they, they just sort of see everything in partisan terms um, so that's going to be a challenge but if, if that doesn't just poison everything between Democrats and Republicans in the next Congress I hope it won't uh, there are some chances to work together on legislation and 
the, uh, I think the most exciting possibilities include um, fisheries. Anyone care about fisheries management? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was the lead Democrat trying to work out a bipartisan Magnuson-Stevens reauthorization this last Congress. I was working with Don Young of Alaska, who is an incredible character. I get along with him really well, even though uh, his politics are just kind of scary really, um, and we were this close to a bipartisan reauthorization of the Magnuson Act, um, which had been made really tough by his Republican committee staff because they took this historically bipartisan fisheries bill and loaded it up with all this anti-environment stuff, you know, little waivers of the Endangered Species Act and attacks on the Antiquities Act and runs at National Marine Sanctuaries and all kinds of things that did not belong in this bill. And then they took the pillars of what has made our American fisheries the most sustainable in the world, the envy of the rest of the world. These are provisions in the Magnuson Act that require enforceable rebuilding time frames when a fishery is actually overfished and really science-based catch limits. This is kind of the, the discipline of the Magnuson Act and they, they created broad exceptions to that for their favorite industries. So uh, that made it tough. At the end, I couldn't get there. They passed a partisan bill that we had to all oppose, but uh, Don Young and I are gonna get a bipartisan Magnuson Act in the next Congress, and it's gonna be a good one that I think all of you will be proud of. Uh, the issue of healthy soils and soil carbon sequestration is one that has attracted some interest across the aisle, because I've got a lot of Republican colleagues who represent rangelands and grazing interests and others, and they see some possibilities to, um, uh, to maybe not fight about environmental values, but work together and put their grazing activities to work, building uh, healthy soils and doing good things, uh, even as, as they continue to deny climate change a little bit. So we'll, we'll talk more about healthy soils than carbon sequestration, but I think uh, there's the possibility to team up with someone like Rob Bishop and other Republicans in the West and do a big bill that'll help pull some carbon out of the atmosphere build healthy soils and also support sustainable uh, grazing. Water is an issue that has become really radicalized and we spent the last six years fighting with Republicans because they thought the solution to Western water shortages was to pit fish versus farmers and try to gut the Endangered Species Act. And uh, we're gonna have a very different conversation with the gavel in my hand on the Water Subcommittee. We're gonna talk about real solutions. One of the most obvious involves Corps of Engineers reservoirs. Uh, I'm just gonna try not to wonk out. I, I only have like a, two minutes left, I'm being told, so I'll talk fast. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers operates its reservoirs uh, using these old three ring binders from the 1950s. And uh, they look at backward hydrology, they run the numbers and they determine what are the probabilities of flooding tomorrow. Uh, and we have these great new things called satellites and they can actually tell you the probabilities of a major weather system coming in and, and we can actually use science instead of backward hydrology and extrapolating in a really primitive way. So I've been pushing this thing called forecast informed reservoir operations. I was this close to getting an extremely conservative Republican from Arizona to co-sponsor this bill with me until a staffer convinced him that it was like some stealth climate change thing even though he couldn't really figure it out, but there was something climatey about it. And so <laughs> they, uh, they spooked him on the bill and we couldn't get there. But in the next Congress, we're gonna be able, I think, to, to do forecast informed reservoir operations and a bunch of other just common sense, low hanging fruit water solutions. Um, I will mention just, to, just one more, it has to do with fire, right? We're all breathing this terrible air. Uh, there's an incredible, um, I think, desire that cuts way across party lines to do everything that we can, especially here in the West, to make our communities more resilient, more fire ready. And how we manage our forests is part of that. And we're not gonna solve it by raking the forests, okay? So um, please disabuse yourself of that. There's no, there's no Finland model that, that is gonna um, save us with rakes. But there is a lot of work that we can do in our forests that will make them healthier, that will make them more resilient, that will create some economic activity in rural forested areas like many of the ones I represent on the north coast of California. 
And I'm confident that we're going to be able to find some ways to work across party lines to get that done without gutting any environmental laws or taking any environmental shortcuts. So those are the few of the things that I'm actually excited about uh, that I think will make for a better conversation across this partisan divide. It's just a great conversation to have, though, when you're in the majority. So let it begin. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks, Aaron. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Huffman.